Um, thank you, Michael, and, and thank you, Martin, and, and two degrees. Uh, uh, I'm glad to be here this evening to meet you all in, in person and uh, extend uh, our experiences uh, in helping companies innovate their products and business models, leveraging sustainability as a strategy. Um, it was interesting uh, during the reception uh, time frame, uh, someone asked me how long I've been, when did I put many of you together 10 years ago? Some of that seems like a long period of time in this space. <laughs> we, we've all been professionally, I think, uh, involved and engaged in various ways and contribution over the years in different roles and organizations, but uh, we've had the opportunity, uh, uh, the wonderful opportunity to collaborate with some major uh, Fortune 1000 companies globally. Uh, so I'll give a bit, uh, a little bit about that, and then talk through some some trends I'm seeing and we're seeing as a practice uh, across the global energy markets, uh, oil and gas, the utilities, and uh, downstream as well as some of the uh, some two case studies, just very high level summaries of the innovation that's occurred. So um, uh, we've had a chance to collaborate uh, in multiple sectors, uh, oil and energy, oil and gas, uh, including uh, utilities, clean tech companies, rethinking their business models. Uh, in the manufacturing sector, from uh, building products to chemicals to flooring products, uh, to the consumer uh, space in terms of consumer products as well as apparel, uh, a pretty broad sector that sector focus. And if you think back 10 years ago now, um, that was born from the, 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 the demand in the marketplace where corporations were just trying to figure out what is sustainability, uh, how to establish a point of view on sustainability, and how to integrate that into their business strategy. Uh, from that work, we've had a chance to um, help companies frame their structural approach to it, uh, develop the processes, implement those processes, and measure the ROI over time. Um, I can tell you going back 10 years ago now that oftentimes when I was sitting in the boards and the C-suites, that spelling sustainability was difficult. It's become a, a term of art and it's kind of sexy in the marketplace today. Uh, I can, you know, 10 years ago, ESG, Environment, Social Governance, uh, was, was not a widely accepted parameter, except for some of the founding principles like, like John Cusack, who's here tonight when he uh, put Innovest together. So um, what I bring tonight is just some, some, some shared respect uh, for many people I've had a chance to collaborate with in our practice. We have 10 people. Uh, we're based in Denver, and we have folks here in New York uh, in The Hague as well, and, and a network of professionals around the globe. So uh, um, from that, a um, couple points of view on trends in the marketplace. Uh, energy. Um, we see the oil and gas sector. Uh, how many folks were last week in Monterey at the Sustainable Brands Conference? Just show of hands. Just curious. Okay. It was interesting in the Sustainable Brands Conference, which was primarily uh, global manufacturers of brands, uh, there was no energy companies there. It's the foreigner pound gorilla in the room. And we must address that. So we've had a chance through our work over the years to, to engage. And in the short term, as, as global policies are, are, are promulgated and, and companies are repositioning their business models, our work is focused on helping the, those companies who create the energy we currently need uh, to do it more sustainably. And uh, so in that sector, we've had a chance to work with all the major uh, oil and gas operators globally and help them uh, look at uh, environmental and social performance as a strategy for operational excellence. And then we measure that. Uh, we're proud recipients of the uh, Society of Petroleum Engineers Global Knowledge Management Award for measuring sustainability in the oil and gas space. That's back in, a couple of years ago now. Um, with that, we've had a chance to collaborate with a number of players. I think some companies who are here tonight in the energy space. And, uh, and specifically, we were just engaged uh, by the uh, International Petroleum Environmental Conservation Association, which is the global oil and gas, it's called IPCA for short, uh, the Global Oil and Gas uh, Association for Environment and Sustainable Development to help uh, create a compendium of best practices on environmental and social performance, but it specifically focuses on supply chain. So you'll hear that tonight, I think, through the dialogue that we all have experience is, is not only looking internally at ourselves if you're a corporate entity, but extending past into your supply chain network. And there's a lot of learnings from that perspective. Um, in the utility space, uh, we've had a, uh, as you see globally, the smart grid. It is, the folks are, the, the whole idea of, of uh, innovating and modernizing the grid. We've had a chance to uh, collaborate with utilities to help them think about their, uh, their smart grid strategies, their renewable energy and distributed generation protocols and help them think through uh, innovating the business model. A couple quick examples. Uh, we helped uh, an ongoing activity with Xcel Energy. They're uh, an outfit uh, out west, uh, western US uh, utility. And we helped Excel with uh, their business case assessment of the largest demonstration smart grid project globally. 
it's a complete two-way integration uh, of 40,000 homes in the Boulder, Colorado uh, community. And uh, that has uh, informed learning many new products that have been gone to market, including what they call wind source, which is the customer uh, opportunity to buy wind source uh, fuels. And uh, in the U.S. market, uh, Excel has the largest wind capacity on their, on their grid structurally. Our team has uh, helped them advise to, to uh, develop that product and go to market. Um, we're also uh, looking at uh, Duke Energy uh, in their Ohio uh, demonstration project to understand the opportunities to, for their business case to learn how to innovate their business model, how to create energy, to take, if you will, the next generation energy efficiency programs and drive customer demand towards behavioral change to reducing energy consumption while they rethink and innovate their energy production models to move off of coal, nuclear, et cetera, into the renewables. So one of the things I, I might step back and said, you'll see a trend that it takes time to innovate, right? Uh, the go-to-market opportunities that we think as customers, when we think about Apple products, for instance, everyone wants the iPhone version of the next sustainability development application. The reality is there is a current production environment in hand, and companies need to step back, reflect on as, as a strategy what those opportunities are, rethink their business model, innovate, while they're still delivering current market products and services. So I, I, I share that as a learning, as we see in the marketplace, or for measuring their value, because it's, it takes leadership and commitment from the executives to, to see the long view. Uh, okay, so uh, two quick case studies uh, and then um, on examples of innovation through collaboration. Uh, in the pharma space, uh, last year we uh, worked with GlaxoSmithKline and to help them uh, validate their sustainability strategy. They had an ongoing initiative. Uh, several other consultants, advisors, technical firms, uh, talk about collaboration. It was a wonderful opportunity to bring the best minds and boots on the ground, as we say, in terms of resources to execute and collect the data, turn that data into information and to inform good decisions on business case analytics. Um, one of the uh, outcomes of innovation was the, uh, uh, the opportunity to uh, rethink their entire R&D supply chain model. Um, they were rethinking energy, materials, and water and informing next generation R&D of products. Martin mentioned some examples of the collaboration in two degrees, and uh, that's an example where the next generation uh, capital, capital investment products for GSK will, will be completely sustainable in the next five years. Uh, the CEO announced the iconic uh, footprint-free R&D laboratory uh, as an example, and you may have seen some of the buzz about their solar footprint investments. So the, the built environment table that we'll work on later on, that's an example of energy efficiency in play. Uh, you know, existing business model, current operations, reduce the footprint in the plant environment while you're rethinking strategically how to innovate those products. Um, and lastly, uh, in the consumer product space, uh, a company called Georgia Pacific. They're a U.S.-based multinational. Um, and they make, you know, for those who are not familiar, they make everything from building products to the Dixie paper cup. So the, the, uh, the floorboards, the hardwoods, the two-by-fours, the, the drywall, you name it, they are supporting the built uh, in industry environment. So a quick story, we, um, we helped innovate the Dixie paper cup. That's a little paper cup, right? A little cartoon character. Well, pretty soon SpongeBob SquarePants will have zero footprint in the next generation product to the cycle. And how we got there was just simply a business case agenda that says, what's the opportunity to innovate this product? So we looked at, uh, we started with, surprise, a carbon footprint inventory and said, let's look at the mills in production, let's look at what the opportunities are for energy consumption and production, as well as water and chemicals and materials. So fast forward to the outcome, the, we had an opportunity to innovate the energy production cycle from moving from burning six oil at the plant to biofuels, as well as solar panels on the rooftops. Uh, we were able to invest some capital investment on, on uh, rethinking the, uh, the water treatment process, so the reduction of water consumption was 80%. Uh, the chemicals were taken out of the process and, and moved into other bio products. Uh, the inks were mo moved into soy products. Uh, the waxes were taken into a different model itself. And long story short was the next generation, you'll see a new product that actually, as a business case, reduced their operating cost by 18% and at the same margin. So for the suburban moms, it becomes a, a no-brainer, if you will, and it's now a guilt-free opportunity to buy a product. So. I give you that as a window of time, about 18 months, as, a, as an analysis that was the, the, the commencement of the business case to the decision points that management had about reallocating assets and rethinking some of the business model. 
Uh, they have a product packaging institute. We're partnered with Walmart's model and, and Tesco uh, globally. We've had work with their European conglomerates in, in rethinking to adopt the Tesco model, as Martin mentioned, about their innovation of packaging reduction. So as companies think about dematerializing products, um, that's an innovation opportunity. So with that, um, I'll pass the uh, mic. Dixie cups to shot glasses. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> uh, hi, everybody. I'm Roberta. Um, I'm the environmental um, director for Diageo, which is the world's largest producer of uh, premium alcoholic beverages. You might know us by uh, some of our brands, Smirnoff, Guinness, Johnny Walker, Captain Morgan, j and um, and a few others. Um, my role in the company is to, um, as Michael said in my intro, is to set and help the business implement an uh, end-to-end -end supply chain strategy for environmental sustainability. And a couple of the case studies that I'm going to talk about tonight touch on other elements of the sustainability stool, the economic and the social as well, but my role in the company is really focused just on environmental sustainability. So um, for anybody in the room that's, that's um, been in the environmental business for a while, you'll appreciate this. Um, I have zero compliance responsibility anywhere in the world, <laughs> which is a great thing. I know. It's great. Um, I do only strategy, and um, it's uh, been a long time coming, but it's, it's a great job for a great company who's very committed to uh, the environmental agenda, um, really for reasons that um, are at least much um, the right people in the right places in the company get it as it is f um, for reasons of cost effectiveness, effectiveness and um, business case analysis. So it's kind of a nice um, environment for a tree hugger like me um, to, to be operating in. Um, I have two case studies on um, innovative approaches to sustainability that I wanted to talk about. One has to do with rum and one has to do with beer. Who wants beer first? Anybody? <laughs> yeah, all right, we've got a couple of beer drinkers in the crowd. Um, this one is, it doesn't have much of an environmental sustainability component, but it has really solid um, economic and social sustainability components. And it's uh, a story that takes place in Kenya. Um, and the, the history with this is, um, Back in uh, the year 2000 and in the, the, the 90s, there was a tremendous kind of ec epidemic, if you will, of illicit brewing of what we in the States would call moonshine, um, methanol-based beer products. And um, for those of you that don't know, methanol is really bad. It makes you blind and it kills you if you drink too much. So, but it's very cheap to make. Um, so there was kind of an epidemic in the Kenya market of um, people who couldn't afford the, the higher priced beers, which were taxed quite heavily, um, turning to the illicit brews that they could get on the streets and um, being you know, severely injured and, and killed. Um, and part of our uh, responsible drinking um, program at Diageo, which is a pillar of the, the company as well, uh, saw an opportunity there to um, provide a, an alternative to methanol-based um, brew with a um, inexpensive but um, healthier, if you will, um, product called Senator Keg. And uh, so we launched in, in the year 2000 in Kenya uh, our Senator Keg brand. Um, we had no intention of ever making any money off of it. It's a very low profit margin product, which is very, very unusual for Diageo. Um, we have very high profit margins in our, in our company. And in fact, with some of our new innovations, if it has a profit margin of less than 40%, we don't consider it. That uh, gives you an idea of how high our profit margins are. And yet we, we moved, we decided to launch Senator Keg because um, the problem in Kenya was, was so great and our, uh, it fits so well with our responsible drinking and our responsible marketing program. So we partnered with the Kenyan government. Um, we set up um, kiosks and trained local entrepreneurs, many of them women, to, um, to sell Senator Keg in um, you know, regular bar environments. Um, and we produce it only in Keg. 
Um, so there's no kind of packaging impact or waste disposal issue associated with the packaging. And it's very inexpensive and it caught on like wildfire and um, has really uh, had a dramatic impact on the um, social um, impact of the illicit brew trade in Kenya. So um, that's a story that uh, we're all very proud of in, in Diageo and 10, 11 years later um, we might turn a little bit of a profit on it, but it still is, is not a profit-making venture, but um, one that we're fully committed to um, from here on out. So that's my, that's my economic and social um, sustainability story about beer. Uh, let me talk now about rum um, and move you across the world to um, our own U.S. Virgin Islands, uh, St. Croix to be specific. Uh, we, we opened in November of last year a brand new rum distillery um, in St. Croix that will produce all Captain Morgan sold in the U.S. market. Um, so if you're a Captain Morgan drinker after you hear this story, you can feel good about it. It'll be guilt-free. <laughs> um, the, the deal there was we partnered with, um, I don't know if, if it would be called an innovative public-private partnership, but it was certainly unusual, I think partnered with the um, governor of the Virgin Islands um, to build uh, a rum distillery and he agreed to build it to pay for the, the cost which was something like 130 million dollars if we promised to um, make and sell Captain Morgan from the Virgin Islands for the next 30 years uh, which we agreed to do. Uh, it was a great deal for both of us. It brings um, millions and millions of dollars in tax revenue into um, St. Croix uh, every year that they did not prior, uh, have previously. It's a great deal for us because it brought the cost of goods sold for our um, Captain Morgan brand way down. Um, and it generated uh, 60 new jobs for, uh, for the island, 80% um, of which Diageo committed to sourcing locally. And um, when, we, when, we dis when we agreed to source locally, we spe specified that this would, local would not mean poaching other non-locals already on the island from other industries, but rather it would be truly people, you know, living and born and raised, if you will, on, on St. Croix. Um, so that was kind of the economic and social piece of the, of the Captain Morgan distillery story. The environmental piece is, it is, um, I can almost hold my hand on my heart and swear this to be true, not quite, because we haven't done extensive benchmarking, but it has got to be, if not the most uh, water and energy efficient rum distillery on the planet, one of the most, um, certainly the most energy and water efficient rum distillery in the Caribbean. And having been to many of them, I can tell you that um, the bar was somewhat low, <laughs> um, but we set it very, very high. Um, as distilleries go, it operates at about 10 liters per liter. Don't quote me on that because we're still in commissioning mode um, for, for water use, uh, which is extremely efficient. Uh, it has a, um, uh, an extensive water reuse capability where process wastewater is uh, captured, treated, and reused. Uh, it also has a bioenergy plant um, at, the, at the site uh, where we take the organ heavy organic wastewater from the distillery, all the spent grains and um, husks and stuff that, that comes from um, processing the rum, and um, we put it through anaerobic digesters, capture the methane that's created, and use that to power 30% uh, of the plant's uh, power needs. So we estimate that had we not done that, if we were operating the entire plant on diesel fuel, which is really the only option in St. Croix, they have no natural gas provision there, um, we, would be, we would have been operating probably, emitting probably about 30,000 Ton, metric tons of um, greenhouse gas emissions uh, into the atmosphere uh, as opposed to the way we are now. So we really shaved 30% um, at least of the uh, site's potential carbon footprint off <coughs> from the start. So extremely um, carbon efficient, extremely water efficient, a great economic story for the island, a great economic story for Diageo, 
and some uh, quite a bit of social benefit as well in the area of increased tax dollars and um, new jobs. Um, so those were my two case studies. Let me end there and hand over to my colleague. Hi guys, I, uh, I don't think I can match up to either of them in scale or focus. Um, for those of you who might not be familiar with Vault, uh, we are an online career information and management website. Uh, we offer rankings, ratings, and insights on career paths, companies, colleges, universities, how to transition between them, how to advance among them, and how to choose the right school, the right path, and so on. Um, among all this research is a small team of us that I belong to called Content. Uh, we like to call ourselves Content is King. Uh, not really, but, um, and we look at all that research that's coming out of our research and consulting every month and tie it to what's going on in the news um, and talk about how is it relevant to your job and your career and your industry. Um, and how I fit into that is I talk about CSR, not just not as a corporate culture, but also as its own career field. Um, and when I talk about CSR, I include sustainability in that. So how is sustainability emerging as a field of professions? Um, and I think most of you would agree that not all of you came to where you are today with the same background, with the same skill set. Um, so I spend 24 hours a day trying to analyze how someone becomes a sustainability practitioner, what kind of skills they get, how they came to where they are, um, how is this dialogue on campuses, which is huge by the way. Um, I do a lot of workshops with undergraduate students and graduate students and uh, Every time I ask them, what do you want to do, they'd say, I want to work in CSR. What does that mean? Make a difference? How does that translate for your resume? Not sure. Um, but the dialogue is huge. Um, faculty is trying to uh, respond to that. Um, and that's where we come in. We see ourselves as the engagers and the connectors. Um, so just to put it in perspective, um, our supply chain is students, job seekers, recruiters, HR, and brand managers. Um, and so when I think about collaboration and innovation, I turn to social media. And just to, our table's really thin. Come on guys, someone wants to talk about Twitter, right? <laughs> someone? All right, well, I, I, I want to put a question out there before I uh, talk about the examples I have. How many of you in this room is on Twitter? All right, can I say about half? So the other half who are not, I welcome you to stop by our table to learn something new because I think you might be interested. Um, so the three examples I have are one, um, last year, uh, it's a little dated but still relevant, Wall Street Journal posted an editorial uh, by Professor Anil Karnani out of Michigan on the case, to get, case against corporate social responsibility. Um, and hopefully some of you read that. I read it first thing in the morning. I'm a former Wall Street Journal employee, um, so I hold that journal close to my heart. Um, I read that early in the morning and the first thing I felt was rage. Um, <laughs> the second thing I felt was, oh my God, I need to talk about this. And the third thing I did was I went on Twitter. Um, I talked to a lot of people all day through Twitter and Facebook and LinkedIn. Um, a lot of them are in the UK where sustainability is not just a fad um, that a lot of people in the US still think it is. Um, and so we got talking, we analyzed that editorial, and within one day prepared a 2,500 word with 12 people talking, giving their response to that editorial, and we sent it to the journal as an editorial in response to Karnani's piece. Well, first they said no, um, because we were attacking not just the journal for giving it space, but also Karnani for his perspective. Um, so we said, okay, so we put it up on Forbes, we put it up on Vault, uh, which is niche, uh, but through social media we were able to get thousands and thousands of people to come visit and comment on it. Um, and then what we did, a month later, we did a follow-up webinar with eight people on a panel hosted by Fenton Communications, which is a public interest communications agency based out of New York. They invited Karnani, who came, uh, along with seven other people, including two journalists, a VP for CSR, a VP for sustainability, a professor, um, and kind of to just talk out what his main argument was. And what came out of that webinar was not whether he was right or wrong, but the fact that we all collaborated as a community of professionals who want to know where this is going, what it means to each of us, and where we stand in this whole big realm of responsibility and accountability. Because we all um, 
come to this very differently. We all see it very differently, and but it kind of relates to everyone's job. So that's just one example. Um, uh, one more example that's, that's more micro but more recent is um, we do a lot of surveys, and one of the surveys we recently launched was emerging professions and sustainability. So of course, the first place I turned to was my community on social media. Um, I, we launched it about three weeks ago. Within two days, I had 412 responses. Um, and uh, having been doing service for about five years now, I can tell you that that's an incredible number of companies. Some of you are here, hate surveys. Uh, we're all part of this survey turmoil. How many should we do and which one should we do and don't have enough time and what is important? And so getting through that entire mindset is a big process. Um, so to get that kind of a response purely through social media and knowing that these people are engaged on these issues every day. Some of them work as independent consultants, some of them work for companies like those represented here. Um, for me, that was a huge response and we just closed the survey and we were close to 900 responses. Um, unheard of. Um, so that's one more example and that's, I know those collaborations sound a little less meaningful than what we represented, but I think in, in, our, in our small world of career information, it was a big win uh, because for the first time we were able to use social media towards something tangible, data-oriented, and not anecdotal, like, oh, I love Twitter, it lets me talk to people. Um, so two examples here. I, I, I can go on, but I'll stop there.